Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lars Holstrom. I'm a faculty member here at Augustana, and I'm the director of the Alberta Center for Sustainable Rural Communities, which is the geographic identity here. I'm very pleased to welcome you this afternoon to a co-hosted luncheon. Uh, it was co-hosted by the ACSRC and the Office of External Relations here at Augustana. And to welcome you to a public lecture by Dr. Cheryl Bartlett, who's a distin distinguished alumna this year. Dr. Bartlett is a professor emerita at Cape Breton University in Sydney, Nova Scotia. She retired from her position as professor of biology and tier one Canada research chair in integrative science in December of 2012. Cheryl is in many ways local. She grew up in Dutchess, just north of the Brooks, in the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy. She graduated from high school at Camrose Lutheran College. I will not tell you when, but it's on here. Cheryl paid me to keep that out. During her time at uh, CLS, Cheryl worked in the cafeteria, worked in the student council, and joined both the varsity volleyball and canoe teams, and at one point regaled me with stories of sitting and sweating in Old Main when she was younger. Cheryl went on to complete her Bachelor of Science with Honours in Zoology at the University of Alberta in 1977, and followed these with a Master's of Science in 1980, and a doctoral degree in 1984 from the University of Newell. Both degrees involved research on the nematode parasites of wild animals. She did postdoctoral work in Paris and also served for several years as assistant editor for the International Journal of Wildlife Diseases. Cheryl started working at Cape Breton University in 1989, teaching biology, parasitology, and infectious diseases. She soon transitioned into integrative science, a transdisciplinary effort to bring indigenous and Western scientific knowledge and ways of knowing together. She worked closely with Mi'kmaq elders to create a unique degree program which serves to attract more Aboriginal students into the post-secondary sciences. Both the undergraduate program and Cheryl's related research activities have adopted two-eyed seeing as a guiding principle. Over the years, Cheryl and elders Merdina and Albert Marshall have given almost 200 presentations on integrative science and two-eyed seeing for local and international audiences. And I'll just add, at a personal level, that that same work uh, as a co-authored chapter is part of a book that I've edited that's forthcoming uh, with McGill Queen's Press. And so I can speak firsthand to the quality and the integrity and um, the innovation behind that kind of work. Cheryl was awarded a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Integrative Science in 2002. This is no mean feat. And in recognition of her work, she was appointed as a member to the Order of Canada in December of 2011. Cheryl currently lives in, in Sydney, Nova Scotia with her husband George. There are three dogs. And she is here today to speak to story, science, and story. And I'm very pleased to welcome. I hope you join me in welcoming Dr. Cheryl Bartlett. back here in Camrose. I feel that uh, in many ways this is home and there are so many familiar faces here. I would also like to acknowledge the territory of the Cree people that I'm here on today. I would like to acknowledge two very special people in the audience, my mother and my sister. Sometimes you have to bring your own groupies. <laughs> And I really would like to thank Lars and all of the people who have made this trip today very, very special and important for me. I'm going to go really fast today. I'm going to try and do it in a really visual way. I'm going to fly. So some of the concepts I'm not going to be able to sink down into. I'm just going to be like a stone skipping over water but I would welcome any questions afterwards. Today, it's a great day. What? Who and Piglet are agreeing, eh? It's a perfect day today. My overall conclusion, there's going to be two of them. We're in this together. And post-secondary institutions like Augustana Campus of the University of Alberta, Meaningful, multi-level, and accountable commitments to working with communities such that connections and participation and stewardship are 
really embedded in what we're doing when we're talking about an initiative such as the story that I'm going to share with you today. So really, really important. When you see this slide again, you'll be able to go, <laughs> she's finally finished. <laughs> so I made the trip, having grown up in southern Alberta, all the way over to Cape Breton, and my mom says, my goodness, Cheryl, you couldn't be any further away from home and still be in Canada. But fortunately, I do get to come home every so often and spend time here. And that trip was, of course, by way of Camrose and by way of Edmonton. And I also spent several years at the University of Guelph, as Laura's mentioned. The yellow box represents the Southern Alberta home. The red box represents my home in Cape Breton. So really, my mom is quite correct. I couldn't be any further away from home and still be in Canada. I also went, as Lars mentioned, from having grown up in the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, to getting my very first job as a university professor in the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. More importantly, and it's the story that I want to share with you today, I made the journey from being a scientist, schooled and educated within a typical mainstream way of educating scientists, to side by side working with elders from the Mi'kmaq Nation and coming to learn very well Indigenous knowledge. And really, that's the story that's the science in the story, and it's the story from here to there and back again. Here are two elders from the Mi'kmaq Nation that are very, very special to me, Albert and Ladina Marshall. They are my friends, my colleagues, my teachers. We have spent hours and hours together, and as Laura's mentioned, we've given hundreds of presentations together, coast to coast to coast in Canada, some internationally. And of course, my mom. And Elder Albert is the person who has long said the foundation the foundational basis for any relationship is an exchange of stories. And that's a theme that will recur through this presentation. So if you can just kind of think, okay, we're talking about stories and we're talking about exchanging stories and the relationship of stories. In late October 2010, Rodina and Albert and I had the great privilege of being at Blackfoot Crossing and that's located at the tip of the arrow there. That is the place where Treaty 7 was signed. It's a National Historic Site. Just as a reference point, in case you need it, there's Calgary, that's the black. A better reference point, I realize, would be the village of Duchess, where I grew up. <laughs> but maybe a better reference point is Camrose, and as Lars mentioned, I think uh, Albert and Mardina and I were here in 2010 because we participated in a conference that Lars organized, and we gave a presentation called Spirits of Health. And of course, we stopped at the Battle River, and the Battle River is very, very special to me, and it also is the area that more or less is the boundary between the traditional territory of the Blackfoot and the traditional territory of the Cree, give or take some maybe hundreds of kilometers some years, or just a few other years. All right, let's go to the other side of the continent, Nova Scotia, to the land of the Mi'kmaq. The island of Cape Breton, that's where I currently am. Uh, Eskasoni First Nation, that's where Albert and Mardina call home. Cape Breton University in Sydney, in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, and if you need a reference point, okay, there's Halifax. Right? <coughs> In the late 1980s, both Merdina and I were on faculty together at the university. Merdina was in Mi'kmaq studies and I was in biology. One of the observations that I made as a biology professor is that there were lots and lots of Mi'kmaq First Nations students at the university, but none of them were in my biology courses. It wasn't just me. They weren't in the biology program. In fact, they weren't in chemistry and they weren't in math. The Mi'kmaq students, the First Nations students, were not in the post-secondary sciences. 
And actually that picture of Aboriginal students tending not to be enrolled in sciences at the university level is a picture that you see across Canada. Mind you, it's changing, and I again point out this is the 1990s, late 1990s. So I said, Mardina, what's going on here? What needs to happen to encourage more Mi'kmaq students and more Aboriginal students to enroll in post-secondary sciences? And Mardina had a very simple answer. Cheryl, change the way you teach science. <laughs> Enrich it. Bring our knowledge into what you're doing. And so we created a brand new four-year degree program called Integrative Science, in which we said we will bring our knowledges together. We will bring our mainstream Western science side by side with Indigenous knowledge, with First Nations knowledge, with, with Mi'kmaq knowledge. Depending upon the audience that we're explaining that to, I might say, okay, we're bringing our worldviews together. Try and tell university professors you're bringing your sciences together. But I'll tell you what works best of all, we're bringing our stories together. So this is the way that we define the very unique, radically innovative science program that we created from scratch, bringing our stories together, side by side in the science classroom, science field trip, science research project, science laboratory, let's do it together. Elder Albert, who was very much a participant in that from the conceptual stages right through until now, has brought forward a guiding principle that he calls two-eyed seeing. And he defines that as from your one eye, learn to see with the best, the strengths in, the indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing. And from your other eye, learn to see with the strengths or the best in the Western or the mainstream ways of knowing. But most importantly of all, learn to see with both those eyes together for the benefit of everybody. And I usually say not cross-eyed, but truly binocular. And that's the image that Elder Elbert asked us to create, was two eyes behind a couple of pieces of jigsaw puzzle, and a very specific reason that Elbert wanted it that way, he said, everybody has a piece of the jigsaw puzzle, and we could say two-eyed seeing, or four-eyed seeing, or 10 eyed seeing, or a thousand-eyed seeing, Everybody, every individual, every culture, every tribe, every knowledge system, we need all of the ideas. The problems we face today are very, very complex. We are in this together. Now, at the very beginning of the month in southern Alberta, an important historical event occurred, not quite on the level of the signing of Treaty 7, but it was an agreement with the National Chief of AFN, Sean Atlio, and the Prime Minister of Canada with respect to Aboriginal education in Canada. And a commitment to talk about five important points was made, and I want to emphasize the third point, because it is the following. Stable and adequate funding for school operations and recognition of First Nations control will ensure the centrality of culture and language in all First Nations schools. This agreement also provides funding to support the development and implementation of First Nations systems. The federal government in Canada has responsibility for education on reserves and thus the reason for this agreement for funding and support from the federal government with AFN. This historic, long overdue funding starting in about a year's time and may it, may it lead to good things. That agreement draws upon years and years of research from people working with AFN, the Assembly of First Nations, years and years of research and community efforts with people working with the Canadian Council on Learning. The First Nations AFN has drawn up an education policy and it formed the basis of the background for that agreement at the beginning of February down in southern Alberta. The agreement draws upon the First Nations Holistic Lifelong Learning Model. This is it. It's shaped as a tree. And thus, the story of tree, trees is going to recur in my presentation. This is the individual learner drawing upon 
sources of knowledge, surrounding in community, the learner has different stages of learning over the course of their lifelong learning journey, both informal and formal, and I wish I had time to really explain that, that very, very comprehensive model to you because it embeds just a tremendous wealth of understanding developed through the Canadian Council on Learning by the Aboriginal Learning Knowledge Centre. And that is the basis for what was signed off on in Southern Alberta at the beginning of this month by the Prime Minister of this country and the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. That's the foundation for it. The reason I want to emphasize it is at the very heartwood of that model of the tree, you find side by side Western knowledge and Indigenous knowledge. In the roots of that tree, you find the same side by side. It's there, it's there embedded in the heartwood of the model. Now, Elder Albert says the following things. Let's bring our knowledges together, emphasize the strengths. We need everybody working together for the benefit of all people and for the ecological integrity of the earth. We need to do this by way of a co-learning journey in which our different paradigms, our different knowledges, our different worldviews can be put on the table and scrutinized. We need to be honest. We need to be able to say that the essence, the spirit of our two ways has been respected as we work to balance the energies of those ways. That's what Elder Elbert is saying. He spent years of his youth in residential school. He's saying, let's work together. He has made his life mission cross-cultural healing, working together. That's what he's asking. Side by side, let's do this. For science education, for science application, for any kind of initiative, and there's lots of them where we can work together. Now let's compare this to what Jeffrey Simpson, who's a columnist for the Globe and Mail, said last week in that column that he wrote, and he's referring to this agreement that was signed off on in southern Alberta at the beginning of February. The big losers will be the students, whose knowledge of basic science, math, and other subjects will be so infused with cultural appropriateness by these theorists as to handicap them rather than assist them in wider Canadian society. That's what he's saying. He has no idea what he's talking about. But he's got an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I don't agree with him. Here's what I would like to think we could do, and this comes from an article that will be forthcoming in Education Canada, a magazine in June of this year, uh, uh, written in conjunction with uh, Michelle Hogue, who's a professor at the University of Lethbridge, and we acknowledge what happened in terms of the sign-off, uh, Prime Minister and Sean Atlio, beginning of February. But we say, hey, look, this isn't just about Aboriginal education. If we truly want a population that can live together with respect and understanding in the 21st century, if we truly want to rectify segregation at all levels, do we need, do we not need to simultaneously educate both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people? In other words, we're in this together. In listening and respecting each other's stories, ways of knowing and coming to know, can we create a third space, a space in between, a liminal space in which we build a sharing relationship while maintaining the integrity of each identity and voice? That's what I would like to think we can work towards in the future. Somebody asked me this morning, how long, Cheryl? And I said, the elders with whom I work say generations. So side by side, if we're going to respect each other, we need to know what some of our key concepts and actions are. If you look on the right-hand side and you're a scientist, you feel like you're at home, a hypothesis. Let's make it, let's test it, let's collect some data, let's analyze that data. Let's have a model and a theory that we construct. That's the way that I, as a Western scientist, do my research. If I'm an indigenous scientist, I have a different set of key concepts and actions. Respect, relationship, reverence, reciprocity, ceremony, repetition, responsibility. 
as equally important as hypothesis, data collection, data analysis. The strengths of each, there they are in a very, you know, big picture way of looking at things. As just a picture in itself, you might look at them this way. Indigenous knowledge is a living knowledge, the elders constantly remind me of. It's bigger. It's meant for you. You have to participate in it. Western science publishes its knowledge. You better not get off the track. It's a very rigorous way of, of creating knowledge. Can we bring them together? There is common ground. There's lots of differences. That's the educational journey that we're all on. Let's go back to that First Nations holistic uh, lifelong learning model. Remember I said it was based on a tree? Tree, the individual. I already said at the Heartwood, we have the journey of indigenous and Western knowledge side by side, very, very core. There's also what are uh, commonly referred to as the four dimensions, the physical, the mental, the emotional, and the spiritual. And then the rings as the tree gets older and older are early learning, secondary learning, post-secondary, workplace learning, etc., etc. All through your life, lifelong learning. These are the different sources and domains of knowledge, language, tradition and ceremonies, the natural world, ancestors, family, self, community, clan, nation, other nations, referred to collectively as the sources and domains of knowledge. If we go to the top part of the tree, the nurturing guides, hey, teachers, I have great teachers here at Campbell's. <laughs> I had great teachers everywhere I went, and I'd really like to say thank you to all those teachers who were so great and influential in my life. You're very, very important. Parents, thanks, Mom. <laughs> elders, Merdina and Elbert and the other Mi'kmaq elders with whom I've worked very closely over the years, very, very important. Counselors, mentors, all of these collectively referred to as the nurturing guides. Important for all of us. Now, a very quick explanation from Merdina as to what traditional knowledge is about. She says you can take four circles, concentric circles. The outermost circle she labels as physical knowledge. She says, Cheryl, Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge shares that with Western science. We know things about the physical world, so you better teach what we know in your science course, eh? But she says here are some richnesses to the Mi'kmaq knowledge that you don't have in Western science or mainstream science. Personal connection, respect, the sacred knowledge, and the sacred knowledge expressible only in Mi'kmaq, only in the language of the people who are indigenous to that area. Note that the person is standing inside the knowledge system. They are part of the knowledge. It's a living knowledge system. It requires many, many knowledge holders. Merdina says, the label of Mi'kmaq traditional knowledge, actually, you guys, you outsiders, you white people, you gave us that label. We prefer to call it this, Dandokliyak. It means, this is what we are. This is how we Mi'kmaq are. That's how it translates. And that's the label that she would prefer. Now, if we go to natural history, which many of us who are in biology love or did as children, you can see that there are some of those concentric circles that Rudina has in her model. The physical knowledge, you develop a real love for what you're doing. And you talk about it with friends, with family. But you're standing a little bit more distant to what you're talking about. Oops, here comes Western science, pushes everything out of the picture. What we have, and I just say, this is big picture. I mean, I could spend months and months and months talking with you about the details here. We love to know things about the physical aspects of the universe. And we love to talk in mathematics about that. And that is a big picture of Western science. And we like to be able to get out of the knowledge. It, it, it's not, I'm not part of the knowledge system. Me, the scientist, I have to talk about it. 
Oh yeah, I can be a female in science these days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we put them side by side? Albert says, Elder Albert says, we need to embark on a co-learning journey of two-eyed seeing in which we put our two paradigms, our two worldviews on the table and scrutinize them and talk about them. And the models are Rodinas, but the issue of labels keeps coming up. What are we going to call these different things? I've been talking about Indigenous or First Nations or Mi'kmaq, Western science. We've talked about integrative science, let's bring them together. There's all sorts of ways that these things get labeled. That's part of the learning journey as to what are we going to call them. So ATK, Aboriginal Traditional Knowledge, MTK, Mi'kmaq Traditional Knowledge, IK, Indigenous Knowledge, TEK, Traditional Ecological Knowledge. As I said, the elders with whom I work prefer their own language, and I agree with them. Science, Western science, mainstream science, orthodox science, conventional science, all sorts of labels. Let's not get caught up in the labels. So, integrative science, how are we going to do this? What's common? Well, we decided our science stories are pattern knowledge. They're about the patterns that we're familiar with. How do we get to learn those, those patterns? How do we come to know them? What are the ways of knowing? So very, very quickly, we can return to this lifelong learning model and remind ourselves that there are a diversity of roots, of sources of knowledge, of mentors that are going to guide us that way, that we are going to recognize spiritual, emotional, physical, and cognitional or mental domains to the universe. All right, very, very important that we remind ourselves of the diversity and richness. We can go to a Western science perspective and talk about multiple intelligences theory. And we can use Howard Gardner's, where he recognizes different intelligences, word smarts, body smarts, nature smarts, people smarts, oh yes, logic and math smarts, self smarts, music smarts, picture smarts, and oh, maybe tentatively I'll talk about, but I won't really, because I can't, I'm a scientist, spirit smarts, all right? So we've got different ways that we can make our patterns and tell our stories. We can connect the dots. And what patterns or stories we come up with will depend upon what approved or sanctioned perspectives come from the culture that we grew up in or the educational system that we were exposed to. So what we do, what we know, who we are, where we came from are very, very important as we learn how to connect the dots to see the patterns to tell our stories. And it might be that you connect the dots and you see a bear, or it might be you connect fewer dots, and you see a big dipper, and then you tell your stories. All right, so if I draw upon all the pattern smarts, multiple intelligences, all of the different sources of knowledge that I can think of, use all those sources of mentors that I can think of, I recognize at least four domains, okay? I'm telling my stories in a way that an indigenous scientist would. First of all, the elders keep reminding me, Cheryl, everything is swimming, breathing, bathed in love. The universe is alive, love. I think it takes an elder to say that because as a young person, <laughs> right? And the stories that I tell are stories that are all my relations and stories. So my science stories are stories of interconnectedness. Let's have a story from Ardina that illustrates that. It's going to be a story of the stars in the night sky. Very quickly, because it really takes a full year to tell this story, and I think I have about half a minute. All right, so we look up into the northern sky at night, and the stars know their places in the story. They know where they fit in the pattern. And we work with Elder Merdina and Elder Lillian to revive this old, old story during 2009, which was the International Year of Astronomy. The story starts in the spring, <coughs> excuse me, 
when Moolin the bear comes out of her den. There's birds that are sitting in the trees on the hillside where her den is. They're starving to death because it's been a long, hard winter and they're hungry and they're hunters and they're going to, oh, here comes the food on four legs and they start chasing that food on four legs all through the summer. Keep chasing her all through the summer. In the late summer, one of the birds, the first one in, in line, this little guy here, he's been carrying a bow and arrow all summer long. He shoots the bear. She starts to bleed. She bleeds more. She dies. Her spirit leaves. The robin, that's this guy here who had the bow and arrow, he jumps on her because he's starved to death and he gets all covered in blood. So he flies up onto the top of a tree and he starts to shake himself. And as a result, the leaves of the trees turn red because they're all covered in blood. And the other birds catch up and they uh, carve up the bear, they have a pot with them, they have a, a nice feast, stew up the bear meat. And the feast goes on all through the winter and the pot boils over and the grease goes all over the land and the lamb turns white. Uh, this is a very important time of the year for the Mi'kmaq people. It's the midwinter ceremony, one of the most important ceremonial events of the year. And then as the winter goes on, a new bear sleeping on her back in her den, the spirit of the bear finds that one. And the story happens over. And the story has no end. So I could stand here for thousands and thousands of years and that story would go on and on and on. Really, what we're seeing, the science, is this story of the bear. Of course, the earth turns on her axis one full rotation each day. So you have to know what's going on in terms of the science. So the story I've just told you is the story of the story. It's the big story of the little story over the course of one full year. And we're looking up in the north sky at the reference positions for those, uh, for telling the stories about two hours before dawn. So that's when you have to look up into the sky to see what the stars are doing. And here's what you would see in spring. The bear's coming out of her den on a hill. She's being seen by the hungry, hungry birds, and they start to chase. And all through the summer, they chase her across the horizon, and in their fall, they they catch up and they shoot her and she dies and she gets covered in blood and the trees turn red and in the winter, all right? So the four sacred colors and as a result in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, where I live in the fall, and see how the relationships, the stories are of relationships, the sky and the land, it's all tied together. The science is rich within that story. If I had time, I could go this detail, this detail, this detail, and show you all the interconnectedness of the science is in that traditional story. And Merdina says, we are, therefore I am. And she says, we are in the collective sense of us, the earth, the animals, the stars, the people, the trees, we are, therefore I am. That's how she tells her stories. Uh, that story doesn't work in southern Alberta. We don't uh, have any maple trees. So these stories are rooted in the land. The land, the sky, the stories emerge from those ecosystems. Okay, I'm a Western scientist. How do I tell my stories? First of all, I can only have a few intelligences or smarts that I publicly acknowledge. The Jane Jacobs, a rather famous person, said this about Western science. It's distinguished from other intellectual pursuits by the precise and limited intellectual means that it employs and the integrity with which it uses its limited means. In other words, it's not just me who's saying there's only a few of these smarts that I can use publicly as a scientist. It's been recognized by many other people. And what happens is my world becomes lots of its objects. So you can take the whole universe and divide it into what I call a staircase with the tiniest little pieces of matter at the bottom 
you go up the staircase and things get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you've got to the top of the staircase, you've got the whole universe. That's one of the strengths of Western science is we take things apart and say, oh, these parts, and then we take those parts apart and say parts, and take those parts apart and parts, and parts and parts and parts, until you get right down to the bottom again. That's one of the strengths of Western science. Those are stories of matter, and there's probably the most common pattern that you'll ever see in Western science, and you all recognize it because you were exposed to it in your public school, right? The periodic table of elements. It's a story of pattern, but we don't tend to teach it that way. And that's where it belongs on the staircase, is right there. And you know, what we don't tend to do too much of at all in our science education in school is talk about, you know, the universe is alive with energy. It is. We might not call it love, however. But I'm not allowed to have me as part of that it story. In fact, I have to become very objective and detached from the perspective of the knowledge if I stay true to the integrity of Western science. Again, I repeat, that's one of the strengths of Western science. So when I tell my stories, Okay, so Lars mentioned that I did work on the nematode uh, parasites of wild animals. I did. These are worms, nematodes, and the uh, little sandpipers are one of the animals that have lots and lots of those worms in. And they fit right there, both the worms and the birds right there on the staircase. They're organisms. And then I can start to tell you stories about disease that these parasites might cause, and disease is a technical term that refers to what's happening at this level on the staircase. And I could talk about inflammation, and that's, you know, what's happening at this level on the staircase. And I could talk about gross pathology, and that's what's happening at this level on the staircase. And I could talk about histopathology, and that's what's talking at this level on the staircase. Or I could talk about epidemiology, and it's at that level. Or I could talk about ecology, and it's those three combined. You see, Western science, we're really, really good about <coughs> Yeah, yeah. We're really good about that kind of thing. It's one of the strengths of the way we tell our stories and call them research manuscripts. We could talk about genes and DNA, and they're down here at this level of the staircase. All right, so when I tell my stories as a scientist, I can tell you about the pros that I worked on for my masters and about the noceums, the biting midges that are important in moving those nematodes, those worms, pro to pro to pro. I can tell you about the rabbits that I worked on for my PhD and the worms that live in their ankles and the mosquitoes that move those worms from rabbit to rabbit to rabbit. I can tell you about the, uh, the uh, coots down in southern Alberta and I can tell you about more of the birds. The interesting thing is there's lice here and they are the things that move the worms from bird to bird bird to bird, lice, very, very important. Before I started working on these coots and these little sandpipers, science didn't know that story. And I was the person who figured it out, connected the dots, made the pattern, went, oh yeah! And I'll tell you something, one of the reasons that I started thinking about lice, totally unheard of prior to what I was working, because those lice came off those birds when I caught them in the wild and they ran all over me and I was just crawling with lice and I dreamed about those lice and oh yeah, my mom was letting me do the, the sections of the birds on our kitchen table. <laughs> I wasn't telling her anything about the lice. <laughs> so I started thinking, you know, maybe just I should, I, you know, I can't even rationally explain it to you. Why did I start picking the lice apart and finding worms inside the lice. I can't tell the story properly, completely, if I only stick to the math smarts, the logic smarts, the word smarts. I can't. I have to tell you about my dream. I have to tell you about my mother's kitchen table. I have to tell you about those lice running all over me. But you know something? I can't tell you about what I was doing. And I, I, when I tell my technical story as a Western scientist, I had an editor of a science journal telling Cheryl, I don't care if you want to thank your mother for letting her, or for, the, for her letting you do the dissections on her kitchen table. That doesn't belong in the acknowledgments of a scientific paper. I don't care, <laughs> he said. Leave it out. 
So I can't put that, I can't put in how grateful I was to my mom. I'm not in the story. That's one of the strengths of Western science. We have to recognize that. But it also means that the stories that we tell leave out a lot of, of the story, all right? I love Western science, I really, really do. I had a great education in science here at Camrose, then at Edmonton, then at the University of Guelph, and I learned a lot while I was teaching. They often say you don't really learn anything until you have to teach it. I learned a lot of science when I became a science teacher. And I've learned a lot from the First Nations elders with whom I've begun to do two-eyed seeing. I've learned an enrichment to the science education that I had. I really, really appreciate when elders tell me, Cheryl, there's a lot more to it. I'm constantly reminded by Elder that we need to share our stories. The relationship that we need so desperately in this country today, we need to share our stories. Albert says, let's find ways to share our stories. If only there were ways that we could have opportunities to hear the stories from other cultures. We so desperately need that. That's what Elder Albert is saying. One of the books that I've become aware of recently and is a favorite book of mine is called The Land is the Source of the Law. It's a book on indigenous understandings. And the book begins by quoting a Canadian scholar, John Doral, who's written a book called Recovering Canada, The Resurgence of Indigenous Law. And it starts off this way. I want, to remember, I want you to remember only this one thing said the badger, if stories come to you, care for them and learn to give them anywhere they are needed because sometimes a person needs a story more than food to stay alive. So let's go back to the Integrative Science Program at Cape Breton University. It did really, really well for five or six years and then it fell apart. That's a long story in itself. But I think it's really important for institutions like here at Augustana Campus, the University of Alberta, for high schools, for junior high schools, for elementary schools, for other universities, that we can learn from the story, from the lessons of us in Cape Breton, because we had a good thing going, then a bunch of parasites jumped on board, called politics. <laughs> We've shared our story in what we call two-eyed seeing and other lessons learned within the co-learning journey of bringing together indigenous and mainstream knowledges and ways of knowing, and we've developed what we call a list of eight lessons learned. The last and most important lesson in that list is that we need meaningful, multi-level, and accountable commitments by places like Augustana, campus of the University of Alberta, Places like Cape Breton University, all the places that are educational institutions at the high levels in this country. We need commitments to community connections, participation and stewardship. And I know that Augustana campus of the University of Alberta has had that in its mission from very, very early on. Please continue to do it. You have lots of lessons here that you can share with other people. My university has it in its mission statement too, but still we fell apart. We need to believe when we say things, we need to act responsibly, accountably, and we need these connections with community. We're putting the science program back together, that's the good news. Things fall apart, things come back together again, things fall apart, things fall, uh, come back together again, things fall apart. That's what Elder Mardina says to me. She says, Cheryl, get used to it. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it is now, the way it will be in the future. So just suck it up and do your work. <laughs> and I said when I, you saw that story or that slide again, that I would be at the end. And I just want to say that it's great to be retired so you can lie around all day like my dog Elsie. But in retirement, I'm continuing to work with Elder Albert and Mardina other elders of the Mi'kmaq Nation in Nova Scotia, because as they say, we've got generations of work ahead of us. So, thank you very much.
have time for some questions. I just need to find the second mic. We'll give Cheryl a few minutes to catch her breath, rehydrate. So we have a runner, Trina. Or Devin. Or Devin. Oh, and I see we have one question over here. Thanks so much. I really appreciated the model based on the tree. And um, in kind of my own research and education, I came across the research that was done in BC about how trees interact with one another, how they will um, take the nutrients from one tree and, and transfer it into the soil and through the microbes to the other trees and, and how that happens. And so I was wondering if that was also kind of a part of your, or if you're familiar with that, or if that was a part of your development of your model and, and how the trees grow together. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for, for bringing that to our attention. Yes, I'm familiar with that uh, understanding of the trees helping each other. Just a point of clarification that the tree model was developed by scholars and university researchers and community participants from Aboriginal communities across Canada. First Nations. Uh, the Inuit developed a blanket model rather than a tree model. The Métis developed a tree model. I had nothing to do with any of those. Okay? But I see the utility and the, the richness of understanding that, those, that that tree model represents. And I love it. That's why I use it so much. So, But I wish I could say I was part of the development of that model. But, uh, uh, again, just following up on the tree uh, metaphor, when we first started the Integrative Science Program in the early 2000s, and before Elder Albert Marshall came up with two-eyed seeing as a guiding principle, we were using a saying from uh, the late spiritual leader and chief, Charlie Labrador in Nova Scotia, and it was, go into the forest, look at the trees, look on the ground, all those trees are holding hands. In other words, their roots are entangled. We, as people, need to learn to do the same thing. What we found was the old people that we talked with in the audience, they knew exactly what it meant because they'd been out in the woods. They'd experienced stumbling over roots and seeing how the roots of the trees are all tangled up. But too many of the young people hadn't been out in the woods, hadn't been out in the forests, and so that saying didn't mean too much to the young people. So then we had to come up with another way, and that's when Albert, Elder Albert came up with two-eyed seeing instead. I think that also points to one of the things that's really, really important in this effort to bring the integrative science back together again, or other similar efforts, it doesn't matter where they are in Canada, our young people need experiential learning opportunities out of doors. Really, really do. We have another question over here. Please introduce yourself as well. Hi, my name is Rajan. I'm a graduate of Augustana and now studying at the University of Calgary. I wanted to ask for your comments about, well, first of all, I'm glad to hear that you spoke positively about the recent federal funding for provincial education. But I'm aware that there is controversy uh, around that, and I was wondering if speak to that. Yes, uh, some of the controversy is related to the amount of money in that it is felt that it is uh, very pathetically insufficient to do what needs to be done. In Nova Scotia, the Mi'kmaq First Nations already have control of education in their communities. They can set the curriculum at whatever they want it to be content-wise yet they do follow the provincial standards. The graduation rate from high schools in some of the uh, Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia is around 87%. It's very high. They are saying that this agreement, as written, is great. The money is pathetic. We need more just here in Nova Scotia, and we're already doing what the Act urges others to do. 
So in other parts of Canada where it's going to have to start from scratch almost in terms of some of the, the educational boards that need to be put together and teacher development, the money is pathetically insufficient. I think that's where the major concerns reside, part of many people. I think there's also a lot of uh, criticism coming from people like, for example, Jeffrey Simpson, columnist from the Globe and Mail, because they don't go back through all of the years and years of understandings that have been put in place that have led up to this agreement. And so that when they say the students are going to hear so much uh, cultural appropriate knowledge that they won't know anything about science, <laughs> that's not true. Because if you look at the AFN documents, they embed right from the get-go that lifelong learning model which has side by side in the heartwood of the tree indigenous knowledge and western knowledge and if you think uh, to what elder albert is encouraging he's saying let's put them on the table let's work with what they mean let's not mess them into a, a, a shapeless useless nothingness but let's respect what this one says this knowledge system respect what this knowledge system says Okay. Jeffrey Simpson isn't hearing that. What he's hearing is, let's put so much of this one into this one that we don't even know which hand it is. And I think a lot of criticism is coming from people who don't understand the long years of work that went into the AFM position. Uh, and I can't speak towards all of the other points and perspectives that are being raised. I know there is a course of voices that are very, very opposed. Uh, and I know that there are people who are very, very hopeful. And at the same time, I will also agree with those people who are saying the money is pathetically insufficient. And it doesn't even start this year. Question in the back. Thank you for your presentation, Cheryl. I'm Gerhard Lotz, I teach physics here at Augustana. I just was interested in the integrative science program, and could you sketch that just a little bit, what a student would experience going through that program? Okay, we conceived the program in the mid-1990s, and we had no model anywhere else to look at, so we had to teach ourselves by the seat of our pants how to do this, so your question is a very good question. We had some uh, experts in indigenous science or native science come and give us some pointers. I believe that the best one, at least the one that sticks out in my mind and in my heart the most, came from Dr. Gregory Cahete, who's a native scientist at the University of New Mexico. And he said, have courage. Learn to do it as you're doing it, by the seat of your pants. Be creative, be imaginative, and have a sense of humor. I think that was the most important lesson. So how did we do it? We decided that we wished to include the physics, the biology, the chemistry, the geology, the astronomy, the different disciplines of the Western sciences in an integrated fashion, but with a major emphasis on biology. We recognized the common ground of pattern recognition. We worked with the elders and the educators in the Aboriginal communities. What would you like us to bring forward? And that was years and years of getting to the point where I could say, we actually have some solidity of understanding as to what we're doing. At about that point, the program fell apart because of the parasites of politics. Right? And it's just now that we're starting to bring it back, breathe life back into the program, to bring the pieces back together and start again. Hopefully, based on what we learned in those early years, understandings of what went wrong, understandings of what was going really, really well, we will have a better model, a better story to tell. So come and ask me in about five years' time. <laughs> but I will repeat, it's believe in what you're doing. Stay with the integrity of the knowledge systems that you've got side by side. And learn to do it by the seat of your pants. And do it together. You need a network of people who are supportive and can contribute. You need community participation. You need institutional buy-in. You need a network. What did I say? Multi-level, meaningful, accountable. 
Otherwise, the parasites of politics will catch up with it. So thank you. That is a very good question that I don't yet have. Here, here's a manuscript. <laughs> Can't. Sorry. So we have a question from Hans, and then two more, I believe. Yes, my name is Hans. I'm a student here at Augustana. And I was wondering if you could speak to whether it's possible to integrate indigenous knowledge in a Western science program, um, like we have here at Augustana, or is it necessary to start from scratch and integrate both of them um, equally and from the foundations? I, I, that's a good question, and I think it's going to be a question that's going to be raised more and more in the future. Uh, I think the answer is get your team together, your community network, community supporters, and ask them how they wish to do it. Do you wish to integrate the one with the other? Do you wish to go from scratch? How do you wish to do it? It needs to be something that the people who are developing it, the community partners that you've got, the knowledge holders, the elders, the scientists, that they feel that this is right for the institution, for the place, for the time here. Right, so I think the answer will, will vary from location to location to location. It needs to draw upon the hearts and minds of the people in your area. Thank you. Question over here, please. My name is Vivian, um, right here. And uh, first of all, thank you. The time is ripe for this conversation. I wonder if you would comment on whether there will be a knowledge loss or gap, or if you feel there is, because we have already lost many of our elders. And, and with the uh, residential school experience, I think we, we lost a lot of the transfer of knowledge opportunities. So I, I'd just like your feelings regarding that. I have worked with elders who have said to me, Cheryl, hurry up. We're not going to live forever. Those elders have now passed on. So yes, I agree with you. The time is now. Languages are being lost. And yet, the elders say it's going to take generations. So it's a very difficult journey that we have to look forward for ourselves. So I think, yeah, let's get with it, and yes, let and yet, let's do it right, let's do it respectfully, and let's do it in a participatory way, which takes time, and we don't have time. And we're losing our elders, and we're losing our languages. And yet, we have to do the process right, or it won't work. And it will be different in each part of the country. It really, really will. I remind you guys that this is a big picture story. I'm just skipping stones across the surface of the water. The details stones sink down into the water are going to be different in each location. Thank you. Another question here, please. Good afternoon. I'm glad I came. I'm from Muscochese. I'm a survivor of the residential school. I just wanted to share some information going back to the one point, is it $1.7 billion? Going back to history, to the history of our people in Treaty 6, it's been 130 years ago, 38 years ago since our ancestors signed a treaty with the Dominion of Canada, with the Queen. In 1894 was our first school in Muscochese. It was situated at Ermanskin School, and that's 120 years ago. And that was the beginning of what the government did to our people through the, you know, to, to assimilate us. I never spoke a word of English when I went into the residential school and I was only about six years old. 120 years of emotional, physical, sexual abuse, 
It's going to take at least seven generations for my people to recover. It was one policy across Canada, and it was to do away with the Indian problem. It's a sad story for our people and how we've been looked upon in our own country. In 1960, was the first time our people were allowed to go into the public school system. And the $1.7 million is a far cry for what the government did to our people. It's not enough. A lot of our people would have been in universities. They could have been, we could have had a lot of people Maybe we could have had a prime minister by now, but we had Mr. Wilton Middlechild as our MP for Petaskin constituency. I'd like to thank the guest speaker today. She brought in a lot of information. I'd like to thank the person that was talking behind me. Yes, we're losing our elders, fast. And I'm glad that if this is the intent to work together, it's got to start now. Because who's to say that maybe, what is the plan for our people as First Nations? with this $1.7 million. There's always a trap when it comes to dollars for our people. What is the next move for the Conservative Party? And I hope they lose on the next election because of what they did. You know, so millions of dollars have been given out to other countries. We have our own third world country in Canada, as we call it. You know, our people are living in poverty. Our people are, we don't have enough graduates, but we are working hard. I work at the Muscogee South Reed School, and it's an awesome school. We have good schools, we have fantastic teachers. You know, we have good administrators. We are getting leadership that are really really supportive with our education. So with that, I want to thank all of you for being here and to get to know us. We're neighbors. You know, come and visit us. Come and join us in our celebrations in Muscogee with our powwows. Come and share with us. Aye, aye. Thank you. I think we are. Time for one more question. Uh, it was just an observation. My name is Matthew. Um, the, the question of language, it came through uh, when you were showing your slides and speaking to us. And I think sometimes that, that language could be a barrier. But if we look at the spiritual aspect, especially the way you portrayed it today, I think you look at language and try and leave language out of the contract, so to speak. Um, an example for me would be, uh, I am a teacher and it's, it's been difficult at times for students to understand my accent. It's much better today than it has been in the past. Um, <clears throat> I had an occasion to teach at college at Art Labish for a summer and I was teaching 12 ladies. Uh, they were in their third year of their apprenticeship for chefs. And we had a wonderful time. All 12 ladies were from uh, the different nations connected to the uh, Laklabesh area, but all indigenous people, right? So we had a wonderful time for two months, and uh, at the end of it all, um, the ladies gave me a, a present, which I guess is quite traditional. And when they gave me the present, they were laughing. 
and uh, it was a very joyous occasion. And he said, you know, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, it was quite wonderful, but you could never understand the thing you said. <laughs> so, in the, the whole aspect, the thing there was that we were doing practical application. Uh, when we were making bread, I wasn't trying to explain the science of bread, we were actually making it. So, you know, I, when we were cutting meats or, or whatever, we were physically doing things. Um, and I also see that with uh, indigenous people when I meet them. I love it when they speak a normal language because they don't know and we observe to stop and look. We can, we can tell a lot. But I, I got confused on one of the slides when where um, your elder had said the language, you couldn't express it. To the, I think about to the fact that the language was a barrier. I, I, if you could just confirm that, I feel that the language for me is, is not a barrier at all. I can observe, I can hear and see. Sure, I can clarify that. If you go back to Elder Rodina's knowledge model with the four concentric circles, She's saying that the outermost circle is physical knowledge, and then the next two are personal respect knowledge. And then the very innermost, the sacred knowledge. She's saying the sacred knowledge itself expressed in the Mi'kmaq language. That all the understanding of the other levels can be expressed in English, sharing English, sharing Mi'kmaq doesn't matter. But there's concern with respect to the sacredness of the language. The sacredness is in the language itself. The, the language is living, the knowledge is living, the knowledge is sacred. <coughs> not Because it's the language is part of it. So it's that part that can't be translated. It's not that the other parts can't or won't be, but just that innermost sacred. And if I think of my own life, there's things that I hold very near and dear to my heart that I don't think I can put into words. Maybe that's the closest I can come to trying to help you understand what Elder Marina means when she says it can't be translated out of Mi'kmaq, out of the sacredness cannot be translated. There's things that you simply can't put into words. Um, Elder Marina also said to me very early on, when we were trying to put together the Innovative Science Program. Cheryl, we Mi'kmaq are very visual learners. To the best of your ability, we do everything in a visual way. I think that's very close to what you were saying. We watch people, we learn by watching, we learn by being mentored, by being involved in a practical activity, an experiential learning uh, opportunity. Uh, those are the things that are very, very important, according to Regina, and I think you've raised that same understanding. Some of those things don't have to be put into words because you're learning through your other intelligences, not just your word smarts. Okay, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for attending today, and particularly those of you who asked questions and made comments. And of course, I would like to thank um, this year's distinguished alumni here at the Augustana campus. We, we have a, just like the Price is Right, you get a parting gift for playing so nicely today. <laughs> You're here for a long time. You're ours now. Thank you, Trina. So please join me in thanking Dr.